Well, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Again, Pastor Browers and Leona were gone for a week, and uh, so I have a privilege of being here, and I hope I share a message that blesses those which have preceded it. Our text for today is from Genesis 32, and it's an interesting story out of the life of Jacob. There's, if you look at the Old Testament in that chronology, there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose twin brother was Esau, and then uh, Jacob took his brother's uh, blessing and birthright. We'll talk about that. And so this is an event in Jacob's life. So that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his elves, 11 sons and crossed the uh, ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and the man wrestled with him till daybreak. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was rich as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. The last few Sundays, Pastor Marty has been preaching a a series of sermons called Connect the Dots. And so in that series, he's looked at a number of Bible passages and see, help us all understand how you, if you go from here, you can get to there by connecting the dots, which are all out of scripture. And so it shows the veracity and the reality that scripture is one unified uh, message of the intervention of God into the lives of mankind. So it's a beautiful story. And that one, it continues to help us understand that the power of God and what he's doing in this world today. But as beautiful as that story is, it is sometimes in my life and perhaps sometimes in your life and perhaps, and I do know this, as people I've counseled, people I've uh, coached, people I've just had conversations with, that in their life, the dots do not seem to be connected. So it's not working quite like scripture says we'd like for it to. In fact, as we think of even some of the hymns we sing here, I sometimes wish we'd print the words and and put them in a phylactery on our forehead so we'd have to remember them every day because we talk about what God has done for us and yet we realize, and I'm one of those two, go out of here and you live a life and you realize you did not, you, you sing the hymn and you mean it and yet we walk out the door, we still do things that we know we should not do or don't do things we know we should. And so as I thought about this, since our church does follow the star and we have this whole piece of connecting to us between the, the Annunciation, but the birth of Jesus and then the crucifixion, uh, that that is the same person. The little baby grew up to be the Messiah who died upon the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. But as we look at that scenario, and if you either you've been involved in Follow the Star, have come to it, and if not, if you've been here at Shepherd Lakes for any period of time, you've heard of Follow the Star. But if you think about this scene, when Jesus was born, the, the infant baby and placed in the manger, then we kind of skip 33 years of his life and come to the triumphal entry. And so there he is hallowed as king, and, and everything is really great of who he is and what he's about on what we now call uh, Palm Sunday. One week, and then so, but we notice that after that, the next scene is the Lord's Supper scene, and we begin to see something happening that's untoward toward Jesus more publicly than we've seen perhaps before that, and it brings to the reality of what's going to happen in the next few days. And that is Judas betraying him. And that comes in that next scene where we have the Jesus at that rock praying diligently, fervently, and as Luke recorded, it's as much as like sweating blood. And he's praying to the Father, you know, remove this cup from me if it is your will, not my will, but yours. And yet at some point, there's some part of his life is saying, you know, my humanity says, I don't want to go die that horrible death upon a cross, but Lord, if it is your will, I will do it. And so sometimes we can feel 
as though when we pray to God, he doesn't hear our prayer, nor does he answer. We can feel, wait a minute, I prayed. I, and whatever your problem may be, it could be a drinking problem, an eating, a drug, anger, a sense of over-control, pornography, internet pornography, the things of what we say we know we shouldn't be doing, we know that, maybe we're manipulative, whatever the issue is in life, and if we stop to think about our lives, perhaps all of us, if not most of us, have something in our life that we have prayed about for perhaps years and even decades, and saying, God, if you just take this from me, life would be much better. Something you want to stop doing, something you should start doing. You recognize you're not really manifesting the love towards your wife and children as you should. You realize you're working more and escaping out of family by going to work more, or whenever you're at home, you escape work by immersing yourself in something. Whatever it may be, we want God to remove that, and we seem to think that God is not there, and if this prayer was such a great thing, why isn't he answering my prayer? Perhaps you move further around, and you're there before Pilate. And you're in the judicial system, you're in a, a, a system where we all live, but there's some organization and structure what things ought to be like, and they don't seem to function that way. And I can think of a, a time when I was traveling on I-35E, going through Italy, Texas, and a police officer pulled me over, said I was going 88 miles an hour, which I started to argue with him. I don't think I ever, I might drive over the speed line, but not that much, besides they're behind another car, um, and I couldn't be going that fast. That was at least my thought, and then he said, didn't you see the sign where the speed limit was reduced back there, and so actually, I could have given you a ticket for more over the limit than what I'm giving you out of the graciousness of his heart, and so I didn't argue with him, because I've been told as a police chaplain, don't argue with the police, <laughs> so I don't. And I didn't then. And then, uh, now anytime I drive up there, I, I look at that and there is no reduction of speed going through Italy, Texas. It's still 75, unless they've changed it from back then. It wasn't just a few years ago. I thought, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't do anything wrong. And then I got a ticket, I had to pay the court fee and all this other stuff, and I was, I was bitter and it took me a while to overcome that, and I think about that. But then, and we may have those stories, and we may, may have something in our life where we feel our, our system did not function well, and I think of one of those that perhaps all of us can identify with very, very easily, because it's been on the news so much, of that doctor through the Michigan State University medical system that misused all those girls who were in the Olympics and other gymnastic programs, hundreds of them. You go, and then you, I don't know if you saw the news, there was a father who had three daughters who were misused by him, and he tried to attack him. He probably would have killed him if he had a chance. And in one sense, I couldn't blame the father of just the resentment, and you kind of feel the system let me down. How can a medical doctor who says he's there to do no harm, or a university like Michigan State University, which is a great university, how could they let this thing go on? How can our Olympic group, the organization structure that runs the Olympic, how could they let this go on? So we can all feel misused. We can feel like we're before, like Jesus before Pilate. He says, crucify him. We feel crucified. Or perhaps even if we move further around the corner, we see the cross. And perhaps we can feel that we've even not only been misused, our prayers don't seem to be heard, this system we live in is not handling us well, and, then, and even this is a, a story that's put together by something, the whole story is not totally true the way I'm telling you because I don't want to identify anybody, but of a young man who I knew he got into drugs against his parents' will, and they got very upset about that, so they kicked him out of the house. And then for a long time, many, many years, he couldn't even call home. And so in time, you kind of feel, I'm cut off from the living. I can't even talk to my mom and dad. And so I've been crucified. I'm treating as though I'm the common criminal, I've been put up on the cross, and I have no value for anyone. And so we can feel that way at times. That's real. The dots don't seem to connect. If we sing the songs, hear the Bible passages, read the Bible passages, we do the right thing. We come to church on Sunday. We participate in Follow the Star. We volunteer within the community. We give to, contribute to uh, nonprofit organizations that help other people. Whatever they are, we can feel that it just doesn't seem to work right. Brene Brown, in her books called The Gifts of Imperfection, 
wrote this, we are the most obese, medicated, addicted, and in debt Americans ever. We are the most obese, medicated, addicted, and in debt Americans ever, and that includes us Christians. We're not beyond the pale of that research. So she goes on to ask the question, why? And her response, we have more access to information, more books, and more good science. Why are we struggling like never before? Because we don't talk about the things that get in the way of doing what we know is best for us, our children, or our families, our organizations, or our communities. And so we know the right thing. Nobody needs to tell you you need to lose weight, quit drinking, get off drugs, whatever it may be, pray more, whatever it may be, we know that. Nobody needs to preach to us anymore. And I can do those things, but it's not helping. And then she goes on, I can know everything there is to know about eating healthy. But if it's one of those days when Ellen, her daughter, is struggling with a school project, and Charlie, her son's home, home sick from school, and I'm trying to make a writing, a writing deadline, and Homeland Security increased the threat level, and our grass is dying, and my jeans don't fit, and the economy is tanking, and the internet is down, and we're out of poop bags for the dog. Forget it. All I want to do is snuff out her words, the sizzling anxiety with a pumpkin muffin, a bag of chips, and chocolate. We don't talk about what keeps us eating until we're sick, busy beyond human scale. We try to compensate, we try to gain our worthiness by doing more, being busy. If I just pray harder, pray longer, if I just am nicer to my wife, to my kids, to my husband, if I do more work at work, if I volunteer more times at church, and whatever, if I just do more, then surely that will validate my worthiness in the world. She goes on, despite the numb that takes the edge off and full of so much anxiety and self-doubt that we can't act on what we know is best. And then she goes on, we don't talk about the hustle for worthiness. That's because such a part of our lives that we don't even realize that we're dancing. And so the perhaps the most tragic thing of that is that we can all be doing this, or many of us, all of us, some of us, whatever it is for us, you know your own story in your own life, that we're in the dance and we don't even realize we're in the dance. I don't realize that I'm really trying to make myself look good for the community. For my, I want my grass to look green so you think I take care of my lawn. I want everything to look, I want my cars washed. I, whatever it is, you have your own thing of what you think is needed so that you look valuable and worthy to someone else. And then the dilemma can be as a Christian and a person who comes and worships here that, that I somewhat feel like a hypocrite because I don't even see God in any of this. He's not on the dance floor with me. And so I struggle with that. And the more I struggle, the more I try to improve things myself. The story I read to you earlier about the life of Jacob, and I'm put it into a context, and it's really a long, long story I'm gonna try to compress into a very short period of time. But the story of Jacob is that he's Isaac's son, but he's Isaac's son of one, of two, the other boy, a twin, was Esau. And you might recall the story from the Old Testament in Genesis, where as uh, Esau came out, uh, Jacob was holding on to his heel, and he was even named Jacob as the supplanter. Now Esau was more of the rugged kind of guy. He's, in fact, his name means kind of red and rud, uh, ruddy, and that he was the hunter, he was the masculine kind of guy, and Jacob was probably the more feminine, if you want to use that language, I don't mean that derogatorily. Uh, but he was um, not of the nature to be this uh, hairy-looking dude here. And so as that went on, uh, his brother, who was a hunter, as we just said, apparently wasn't doing so well at his hunting, and his son, his brother, was making some soup one day, and so Esau came to Jacob and said, man, I'm about to die. Can I have something to eat? I'm starving to death. The supplanter said to him, give me your birthright, and I'll give you a bowl of soup. And he perceived that he was so hungry that he had to give up his birthright for a bowl of soup. And so his brother betrayed him again. And then we see later in life, as they age, and Isaac, their father, ages as well, and his eyesight is diminished significantly. And so he says to Esau, the oldest, 
go kill a, an animal, fix me some stew here, bring it in, and I will pass on the blessing to you. So Esau was his father's favorite son. On the other hand, Jacob was his mother's favorite son. And so even this deception within the family takes place. And so his mother decides, well, what I will do is I'll fix your bowl of soup and you can go in there and you can give it to your dad and get the blessing. And he says, but look, I don't, I don't look like Esau. I don't smell like him. I don't feel like him. You know, he's a rugged, hairy dude and I'm just not. Must don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. So what she did, she got a piece of a lamb skin and put it around the back of his neck so he'd look hairy and rugged back there, put some on his arm. And so she put the soup into a bowl, and he took it in there. He said, Dad, I'm here with the soup. And he said, you don't sound like he saw. Well, I am, though. Uh, he said, well, you got that. You killed that thing pretty quickly, didn't you? Well, yeah, God blessed me. And so then Isaac eats the soup. He puts his arm around Jacob's neck where he felt that fur. And then he touched his arm, and he said, in other words, you don't sound like him, but you must be him. So you get the blessing. Now, in that day and time, once you had the blessing, it is irrevocable. It cannot be changed. Then after this happened, Esau comes in with his bowl of soup. He said, Dad, I'm here. I got the bowl of soup. I'm ready for the blessing. And Isaac comes to some reality. I gave it to the wrong person. Esau was livid after that and threatened to kill his own brother. Mom, again, who was the manipulator as well, maybe Jacob got his manipulation gene, whatever you want to call it that, from his mom. So she sent Jacob over to her brother, a Laban, and to live with him to get him out of the household so that Esau wouldn't kill him. And so while, while he goes over there, and that story goes on, uh, that how he uh, fell in love, actually with one of his cousins, uh, and said, uh, I'd like to marry her. And, Le and uh, uh, Laban said, sure, fine, you can marry her, but you have to work for her for seven years. And so he said, okay, I'll do that. So he was tenacious, and he worked for her for seven years. And then uh, he must have had a wild party on the night he got married. Uh, to the extent that he didn't recognize what he was doing, uh, and to the extent that whenever he went to consummate the, the marriage with his wife, Rachel, um, dad did a switcheroo and put Leah, the oldest, in bed with her, and so he slept with the wrong woman. And he wakes up the next morning and says, oops, you're not the right one. And so dad's over there chuckling uh, because he was able to get rid of his, use that word, uh, oldest daughter. And then uh, Jacob said again, um, well, I really want to marry the other one. He said, okay, for seven more years, you can marry her, seven more years of work. And so, uh, but he did let her marry them before doing the seven years. He did seven years, and eventually, after about 25 years, he left. And then all this story I'm, uh, that I read to you is on the way back home. He's going back home now, and he's got all these camels and donkeys and wives and children and servants. He is a very, very wealthy man, and he's going to encounter his brother, Esau, that the last time he saw him, Esau wanted to kill him. And so he has great fear. And if you read the story, he put his wives and goats and everything else, and he sent all this ahead of himself so that he would kind of appease Esau, and that's even the word used in Scripture, to make him happy because he saw Esau coming with 400 men. And he thought, this is bad news. i got to do something to keep that dude happy. And so he did that, and then uh, while they were all up ahead, he was there, and then that's where he had that story about him wrestling with God. Now you think about this, that, that he, his name was changed to I, uh, Israel, which means wrestle with God, and even changed the, the, the name of the place. But he also in that time, if you read the story, God had him as still a part of the whole thing. If you will be a uh, part of nations that will come out of you and peoples from all times will be your followers of the Messiah. And so, but the point being in that and telling that story, we look at ourselves and we can wrestle with God and realize Prayers may not seem to work. I work harder. It doesn't seem to work, whatever. And we look at Jacob's life who encountered God face to face and got a blessing from God. And you would think that if, you, if any one of us encountered Jesus, if he looked, came right here, if Jesus came right in this door right now and looked you in the eye and said, I love you and I forgive you. I want you to be with me forever. If Jesus, the Messiah, wouldn't we say, and hopefully change the way we live if we have these things that get in the way of our following him. And so Jacob, he had that encounter. And yet when you read the story, he continued to try to manipulate things. And that's the reason why I tell that story. We have our own 
we have a story of Jacob, a man of God, who wrestled with God, still had those things in his life for which he could be ashamed of after he had the wrestling event. One other story. This is the Lutheran Church, and we just celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, which a man by the name of Martin Luther uh, posted these 95 theses. He just conversation pieces on a door in Wittenberg Castle, and so it began something where people began to ask questions because the church had kind of lost its direction, and he was the one who stood up to the Pope and said, it is by word alone, by grace alone, by faith alone that we are saved. I mean, a man of about that much stature, physically, but a heart as big as all of salvation. At one point in his, I've heard it said of him that he would say that I've got so much to do today, I, I can't start with less than two or three hours of prayer. But let me read to you a prayer that he wrote. Behold, Lord, here is an empty cask that needs to be filled. My Lord, fill it. I am weak in faith. Strengthen me. I am cold in love. Warm me and fill me with fire that my love may flow out over my neighbor. Now listen, I do not have a firm, strong faith. I doubt at times and cannot fully trust God. Doesn't that sound like what we could be saying sometimes? Oh Lord, help. Increase my faith and trust for me. In you is locked the treasure of all my possessions. I am poor. You are rich and art come to have mercy upon the poor. I am a sinner. You are righteous. I pour forth a stream of sin, but in thee are all fullness and righteousness. Our lives, that of Jacob, the life of Moses, all reflect the reality that the more we try to do to gain our relationship with God, to do the right things, because he looked at Luther's life and he would sleep on a cold, hard floor. He would fast quite often. He'd eat just a little bit of food at a time. He did all kinds of things to merit his righteousness before God. We can work harder. We can strive more. We can spend more time. We can be on the dance floor and not realizing we're dancing it. And so the question is, where's hope? Where's hope for us? Where's hope for Jacob? Where's hope for Martin Luther? Where's hope for any other Christian and all of time? I think the answer as we look at connecting the dots is clearly in scripture. One of those verses is Psalm 37, seven, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him and do not fret when men succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. Be still. Be still before the Lord. Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Zechariah writes, that prophet, be still before the Lord, all mankind. Then that beautiful story out of 1 Kings about Elijah. Elijah was one of those prophets of God that God called, and he did mighty things for God. It's amazing what he did. And yet, many of the prophets of God were getting killed, and so at one point in his life, he said, you know, God, I don't understand any of this stuff. I have been prophesying for you, and, and all the other guys are getting killed. I'm the only one left. That's not fair. We don't think the justice system is fair. He didn't think it was fair because of what God had called him to do. And so God said this. Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. That is cool. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. 
a gentle whisper. God came to Elijah, not in some great and mighty powerful way that we'd like to see God. Like, show me a miracle, God, to prove that you're really living and alive and you can do things today. No, God can come to us very much in a quiet word. Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to mind your own business. To Timothy, he wrote, that young pastor, first of all, I request prayers and intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone, kings and those in authority. And then he goes on, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And perhaps the verse that all of us know, I've at least heard of, out of not John 3, 16, but Psalm, what? Psalm 23. Listen to these words and think about them. It starts off, the Lord is my shepherd, not my physician, not my power, not my stature, not my physical size, not my position in the community, not my job title, not the house I live in, nor the car I drive, not the big screen TV that's bigger than yours for watching the Super Bowl tonight, but I'm not comparing. Not any of that stuff, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If we could meditate on those words for just a little bit, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It goes on to clarify what is all does this mean. He, the Lord, makes me lie down in green pastures, not in busyness of life and doing more and trying to succeed and make ourselves worthy with our own actions. He leads me beside quiet waters, not white water rafting. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. All this stuff and this business that I'm trying to do to earn my righteousness, my sense of worthiness, he, he, if I listen, guides me in paths of righteousness for his same name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This psalm is probably one of the most read of any, at any funeral of any Christian, probably anywhere in the world. And yet this psalm is not for the dead, or only at funerals, but for our living right here and now, this day, we need a shepherd right now. We don't need a shepherd sometime in the future. We need something right now. The Lord is my shepherd now who will lead me through life and where it's taking me. And he goes on, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows and surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What I'd like for you to do this morning, just as something to consider for the next two weeks, I'd like for you to consider this. One, you find a place to be still and do it. I was talking to a lady and a dedicated, committed Christian and very much uh, a, a loving mother. They, when they, she and her husband got married, they were the ideal couple in Christianity in the world where they were at the time. And so they have three sons. Uh, one is quote unquote normal, and I don't know what that means today. One has ADHD and the other has Down syndrome. And so in talking with her, she said, you know, I just wish I had a normal life. And perhaps you're one of those people, I just wish I had a normal life. And I asked her about her prayer life, she said, you know, by, by the end of the day, I'm just so tired, all I'm gonna do is just crash, I watch TV or whatever, I don't wanna do anything, I'm so tired of making uh, sandwiches for lunch and getting people and all that, whatever she does. And so she's convinced in her mind that she cannot do anything and therefore delimits her listening to God. And I'd say the same thing could be true of any one of us here. We can see ourselves as so busy I don't have time to spend time with God. And yet we come here and worship him, we sing praises to him, we say as our Lord, he is our savior. We even pray the, uh, read the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And so what I'm encouraging you to do is for two weeks, just try this for two weeks, take some time, put down your cell phone, turn off the TV, don't pretend that you need another glass of wine to sleep tonight, 
you have your glass of wine before or after this, I don't care. God doesn't care, but spend some time with him. Be still in a quiet place. Close your eyes. It's helpful to rule out the rest of the world that keeps us so busy and glancing over to see what's happening here, whatever. And then breathe. Breathe in deeply, in and out three times, right into your diaphragm. I think it's interesting that what science and psychoneurology is telling us today about the whole thing of just breathing and that alone is something God knew in creation. Be still, be quiet. God said that. You don't need a neurologist to tell us, slow down and listen. So breathe in and out three times. That helps change the chemistry of your brain. Then focus on five words. That's all I want you to think about. Five words. The Lord is my shepherd. That's it. Now, if you read the rest of that psalm, it kind of is an, un, an explanation of what you just said. But focus on that. The Lord. What does that mean? Meditate on that thought of who your Lord is and that he is your shepherd. And so that metaphor, that analogy of us being sheep and shepherds is that we are somebody who are lost and we need somebody to guide and direct us into the paths of righteousness. And in so doing, if you could do that for two weeks, you begin to realize I can take time, to, part of my life that I think is so busy that I don't have time for God, for God to come in and say, I really like to talk to you and I want to be with you. So may God bless you as you be still, close your eyes, breathe. The Lord is my shepherd, amen. <laughs>